um, and yet he's able to project this dream yes. um, into a completely different relationship for a very different yeah. character, you know, a very red-blooded, red alpha male, sort of out-of-doors person yes, who's quite yes. different from the intellectual, um, slightly difficult Emily, yes. um, and, and to make this amazing house. Right from the start, Lutchins and Johnny clicked. They were kindred spirits, two restless, high-achieving men's men, full of ambition, egging each other on. In Johnson, Lutchins met the perfect client, a modern man, bold, a risk-taker with money. And Johnson's choice of site also played a key role in the creation of Marsh Court, because the house is built on what is essentially a mound of chalk, and Lutchin's determination to use material from the ground in the construction of the house means that the famous white walls of Marsh Court are in fact blocks of chalk. If I rub my fingers along them, I get covered in chalk dust. Incredible. This makes visiting a Marsh Court, oh dear, a rather a dirty business. Chalk is, quite literally, the bedrock of Marsh Court, as its current estate manager, Neil Simpson, is hopefully going to prove. There we're getting, that's a nice bit of, bit of chalk coming up, isn't it? And it's pure white. It's eight inches of topsoil, some flint, and then you hit a chalk layer. Chalk layer. And how, how far, I mean, from your experience working around here, how, how, how deep is that? Drafting. I've never got to the end of it. Right. I've done many holes yes. and manoeuvring of soil and I've never got beyond the chalk layer. Can we dig a little bit more? I can't just, 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 just see what... Is that too hard work? <laughs> As a, what, do you, what do you think of chalk as a building material? As a building material, yeah. I wouldn't build my house out of it. Soft? Yes. Prone to damp? And corrosive. There you go, yeah. And that's the chalk from which the house is built. Break it startlingly wide. I mean, I'd have thought when this was being discussed, you know, Lutchen comes up with this kind of outlandish idea of building a house of chalk. You say, you think the client would say, great idea, but come on, you know, it won't last. <laughs> That's everyone's reaction. How has it lasted? Yeah. Why has it lasted? But it, it's still there, it's still standing. Lutchen's unique sea of chalk announced at first sight, this was a house like no other. And that's exactly what Johnny wanted. Marsh Court needed to be the talk of the town. For like so many new moneyed Edwardians, his house wasn't just about flashing his cash. It was an arena for social climbing and gaining stature, as historian Juliet Gardner explains. Herbert Johnson absolutely typifies a new Edwardian breed, a new elite. There's the phrase, isn't it? They made their millions in town and they spent them in the country. If you were new money and you were really breaking into society, the plutocrats, those who got power through having money, through having wealth, they wanted to be country gentlemen. And that's where the, the money was being spent. It was being spent on houses. Edward VII really set the pattern, set the model for the plutocracy, because of course up to then, on the whole, the royal family had mixed among their own. Now Edward VII, who was always in need of money of course, um, made friends among new money. Somehow money would be able to buy you position, status, um, respectability. And if you had a house, a beautiful house, then that was the container for all that, for that uh, social status. Marsh Court became a magnet for lords, ladies, and indeed, even royalty. Johnny wanted their visits to be unforgettable experiences from the very moment they arrived. So the ever-inventive Lutchens teamed up with his favourite garden designer, Gertrude Jekyll, to make his friend's wish come true. Lutchens and Gertrude Jekyll created a theatrical architectural promenade around the house. 
They used the fall of the land to form terraces and sunken courtyards that offer unexpected views of the house and dramatic vistas over the landscape. And in this wonderful way, they uh, created different textures on the path, like here. There's brick, there's stone, there's grass, adding an extra sensation to the journey around the house. And what a sensation! Taking Johnny's guests on a magical mystery tour into the unknown, twisting and turning through walls and hedges. And so, of course, the perfect place for a party with revellers spilling from the house. I can imagine the Prince of Wales nestling down somewhere here with a cocktail. Finally, they would arrive at the visitor's entrance. A sunlit paradise. One of the most arresting sights in the English landscape. In keeping with the inventive originality of Marsh Court, indeed as a monument to Lutchen's endless quest for architectural surprise, the rear, or garden elevation, is more dramatic and arresting than the apparently main entrance elevation. I love this composition with the great bay windows on my left tottering as if on the edge of a precipice. It is really a wonderful design. Certainly no king or prince could fail to be impressed. Indeed, be overwhelmed. By a series of rooms that are the absolute height of turn of the century flamboyance. Here's the dining room. Strange. Feels like I'm, I'm in a grand cabin. A ship. Which I suppose is not that surprising since the early 1900s was the golden age of Britain's ocean liners, those opulent travel palaces for the super rich and uh, Lutchen's picked up on that nautical style. I must say this room would have been an ornament to even the grandest of the great liners. The walls are fully panelled and indeed the ceiling is partly too with a, a dome in the centre. <laughs> but then there's another quality not, I suppose, intended, although knowing Lutchen's perhaps, I feel like I'm in a giant cigar box. And the architecture just gets better and bigger, straight into a room almost double the height of its neighbour. A feast for the eye, from floor to ceiling. Again, extraordinarily lavish, but also mischievous. It's symptomatic of Lutchen's delight in juxtaposing styles. This truly modern house is adorned with classical carving in wood and chalk nods to Christopher Wren in a fashion that was called at the time Renaissance. The pick and mix approach to detailing in this room is typical of the playful spirit of the Edwardian age. This is Marsh Court's Great Hall, but in its wit and irony, like no Great Hall from the Middle Ages or the Tudor Age. And that really is just the point. Here, Lutchen's mixed historical styles in front of me is a wonderful Tudor-style bay window and then Jacobean panelling. But he mixed these not to fool anybody into thinking this was a genuine ancient house, but really in the spirit of, I suppose, a sort of tailor, you know, taking brilliant fabric, old fabric, and making something entirely new. And at Marsh Court, the old and the new were very happy bedfellows. Lutchens went to town, not just with classical detailing, but also packed the house with most modern conveniences. Ingenious air vent central heating, luxury tile bathrooms, and his own specially designed electric lighting throughout. It all added up to a domestic paradise where Johnny could offer the most lavish hospitality to the most beautiful people.
it was a very, very glamorous life. Herbert Johnson liked to have weekend parties, only of course they weren't called weekend parties because that was rather vulgar, that suggested you had to go to work on a Monday. He invited guests, the smarter the guests, the better. Obviously, there would have been financiers, people from the city. I think there would have been an impetus to import some sort of social butterflies, as it were, you know, some rather beautiful women, um, and some people with some artistic pretensions or literary pretensions to keep things amused. And of course, you, you know, see how high up the, the, the ladder you could go. You know, you rather are on display. You're expected to do a wide range of things. To entertain, absolutely. Are you expecting it to be amusing at dinner? You're expected to be extremely well dressed. You are expected to be something of a sportsman. And then, of course, we mustn't ever forget the bed hopping. Which, the bed hopping. Which I think can probably also <laughs> went on. Whether bed hopping yeah. went on at Marsh Court or not, I don't know. Johnny was now firmly established as a lord of his manor, entertaining on a royal scale. But at heart, he was still a man's man through and through, with a special den to prove it. I sense I'm entering a male preserve. The main, if not only, masculine playroom in any Edwardian country house was the billiard room. Johnny would have spent hours here. Indeed, in many ways, this would have been the centre of his life, while at Marsh Court would have been a lot of heavy drinking. Indeed, there's a story that the Prince of Wales, the future Edward VIII, got so drunk, he passed out on this billiard table. Oh dear, what was to be done? Well, servants were summoned, and the unconscious prince was carried up the stairs over there into the nearest bedroom, which of course has ever since been called the Prince of Wales room. <laughs> Being Marsh Court, this is no ordinary billiard table. The plinth is made out of chalk, emblematic material of the house, which is very convenient because if I need to chalk the end of my cue, all I do is run it along here. Naughty, but it does the job. Like all of Marsh Court's great rooms, this space is fantastically theatrical. And perhaps it's no mere coincidence that in 1904, as Johnny's playground was taking shape, Lutchens was also designing the stage sets for his friend J.M. Barry's new play, Peter Pan. Johnny and Ned, as they affectionately called each other, had a close relationship. As in Peter Pan, they were, I suppose, rather like the lost boys who simply didn't want to grow up. Two chaps of like mind. And indeed, I have here a poem written by Lutchen's Ned to his good friend, Johnny. It's a lovely little poem inspired by drink, no doubt. Um, Lutchen's writes, I friend, drink to thee friend, and my friend, drink to me, at which point I'm sure they would have charged each other's glasses and drunk. Mm. And then Lutchen says, and the more we drink together, the merrier we shall be. That's the sort of friend you need to have. And so, for Johnny and Ned, this house was a boy's own fantasy made real. Despite a bevy of staff, a butler, housekeeper, cook, two footmen and seven maids, Marsh Court was essentially Johnny's bachelor pad. Until, that is, he fell in love. Now retired from the stock market in December 1912, aged 56, the confirmed bachelor finally married. The woman of his choice was named Violet Charlotte Meeking. And she, with her two teenage daughters, Viola and Fanula, moved in to Marsh Court. Violet was a society lady with ancestry right back to Edward III. But she knew how to live it up like the best of them 